Hello. How do we make sense of the presence of evil and suffering in our world? It's a question that's bothered human beings of all faiths and of none, probably from the very dawn of human consciousness itself. And it's generated many different kinds of answers and responses, including among Christian believers, which is hardly surprising, because while this is certainly a huge philosophical and theological question, it's also a deeply personal one that emerges from our own profound and perplexing experiences of life. The book that we're discussing today is called Why Is There Suffering? Pick Your Own Theological Expedition by Bethany Solareda. And I'm delighted to say that the author herself is with us. Welcome, Bethany. Thank you. Bethany Solareda is a postdoctoral fellow at the Laudato Sea Research Institute based at Campion Hall in the University of Oxford. Although she currently lives in the UK, she's a Canadian born and bred and a graduate of Regent College in Vancouver. Her first book was called God, Evolution and Animal Suffering. And this new one continues her exploration of the age old question, why is there suffering? So Bethany, there obviously have been many books uh, written on this subject over the centuries. What's different about this one? Well, I, I think that there are really three things that are different about it. Um, I, I did, as you said, my first book was on God, evolution and animal suffering. And it really is in this sort of classical form of theodicy, more or less. And so I did that as part of my PhD. And I read a whole lot of the books that were out there on suffering. And there were a few things about them that just drove me crazy. So one was that sort of everything was dominated by formal analytical knowledge. You know, if it was logical, then it must be true, you know, and the heart was just exiled <laughs> from, from the discussion. And if you came to a logical conclusion, even if it was horrific, it must be the answer that we should go for. And I, I just thought, I, I, I can't deal with that as a, as a way to encounter this deep question that is so existential that you know deals with with pain with people's experiences i just didn't think that logical analytical reasoning was quite the right way to go about it um the the second thing that bothered me was that it was so full of jargon and terms and you know couched in in a whole terminology that made it really inaccessible. So even as a professional theologian, I sometimes struggle to read these works just because they're they're so technical. And it's almost to the point where they're being technical for the sake of it. There's there's just no way for regular people to enter into this discussion at all. So although all this work is being done, it's not available to the people who are actually suffering. And the third thing um, that really, really bothered me was the sort of her use of horrific stories of suffering. So you have on one side this highly logical system of argumentation that's sort of airtight and erudite. And then to illustrate that they really knew what was going on in the real world, they would contrast this with sort of the worst stories of human suffering drawing from the slave trade or the Holocaust or, you know, horrific stories of, of domestic abuse. And I just found it impossible to read these books because I was so emotionally distressed by these, these stories of suffering that I could hardly read the book. You know, that kind of emotional engagement precluded my ability to think along the logical lines that they were asking me to do. So that's what makes my book different, is it, it, it tries to do something different on all three of those. So first, I, I don't say, let's follow logic to the singular, singular answer. What I try and do is sort of spread out the options for people so that um, it, it, it says, actually, things make different sense depending on where you're standing. 
And, and so I don't use formal logic. I don't use that sort of jargon or terminology that makes it so hard to engage with. And with the exception of one chapter where there's sufficient warning, you know, I don't use any stories of suffering or, or pain. So it, it's, it's a gentle book. The examples are gentle. They're things like throwing a feather off of a roof, not, <laughs> not horrific stories of, of genocide. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, we'll come back to that, um, that gentleness because, um, I mean, suffering is obviously a painful subject, isn't it? Um, but, uh, just wondering, you, you've, you've subtitled it, um, Pick Your Theological Expedition. How does that work? I mean, you know, how, how, do, how does it work in, in, in sort of finding your way through this book? Yeah, well, what, what I wanted to do was, I mean, I found that reading through all the different options in my PhD was actually a really useful experience for me to work out what I believed about God and the world and suffering and so on. So I wanted to give that same sense of exploration to the reader where they just got to pick where they went next. And of course, that's really hard to do in a book that you read from beginning to end because then the author is telling you what comes next. And so I remembered that as a child, I absolutely loved choose your own adventure books where you would read a couple pages of narrative and say you're the princess walking down you know the the forest path if you wanted to go up towards the castle you'd turn to page seven but if you wanted to go down towards the lake then you'd turn to page 11 you know and you turn to page 11 you encounter a troll and then you have to decide whether to be nice on it or stomp on its foot and run away and you know inevitably you died horrible deaths at various points in these books but that that sparked the idea that I could give my readers that same sort of theological choice through that sort of uh, approach. So that's what you do. You read a couple pages and then you have to make a decision uh, about, you know, is God good and loving and powerful or does God exist but doesn't really care about us, sort of the deist option, or does God not exist? And then you flip to different points and you see how to construct a theological argument piece by piece through decision making. So you're not sort of arguing a line, you know, you're not arguing a case in the book, you're basically allowing your readers to choose their own best argument, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. That was that was really the idea because any meaning that a person is going to make out of suffering is not going to be something that's imposed from the outside. That's not how meaning making works. That has to be a work of the person within their soul with God's help. And although I think the community of believers and the community of sort of traditions helps us in that work, that's all I'm trying to do is help people in the work that they really have to do. Um, so I don't argue a lot. And I do have everything from quite, quite conservative views all the way to atheism as possibilities. So I didn't, I, I did my best not to argue persuasively only for the ones I like and sort of, you know, misrepresent the others. And so whenever I had a viewpoint that I didn't disagree, that I, sorry, anytime I wrote about a view that I disagreed with, I had somebody from that camp read it and critique me and let me know whether I was doing a good job or whether I was misrepresenting it. You've even got a, a map here, an actual, actual <laughs> drawn map. Uh, obviously yes. we can't study it now, but uh, it's, um, I mean, it, it, it's got a, a bit of the kind of Tolkien's about it, isn't it really? And I mean, you, you say at the end of the book that you, um, you spent some time reading this to friends in the Eagle and Child where the Inklings used to meet. Um, so yeah, you've obviously been influenced in that way by Middle Earth and that whole notion of the journey, the quest. Absolutely. So not not only did I did I read it out in the Eagle and Child, I'm, and I'm sitting about 20 steps from the Eagle and Child right now. But actually, at the time I wrote this, I was living at the kilns in C.S. Lewis's house. So the majority of it was written in C.S. Lewis's study. Um, and so clearly, they were very much on my mind. And so although the you you showed the map, but the more prosaic part is the the flow chart, which has all the 
options and decisions. Yeah. But I yeah. wanted to really get that sense that this is, I'm asking people to join a sense with a sense of play rather than a sense of if you make the wrong decision theologically, this will ruin your life or put you at risk. Um, I, I, I wanted people to have this sort of sense of joyful discovery. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to go above and beyond the sort of theological positions and put it into sort of a pilgrim's progress landscape. So you're heading up the mountains of mystery or across the open plains of creaturely freedom, just to really sort of give that invite people into a sense of playful discovery. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things about your map, of course, is that while you've got a starting point, actually there, there, is, there is no single destination here. There are many different places you can end up um, on, on the map. I mean, is that frustrating as a writer, uh, as, a, as a Christian thinker? Hmm. It's a good question. It wasn't frustrating at, as a writer at all, except to kind of figure out a few of the linkages. So there are a few places where, you know, you're going along the landscape and then the next choice actually jumps you to the other part of the map. Uh, I think there's I think there's one place in particular which a few keen readers have sort of said, well, where's the road there? And I'm like, well, I, I, I couldn't fit it in. Sorry. So so occasionally that was frustrating. As a Christian thinker, I think it, it, it raises a lot of really difficult questions about is there an ultimate truth um, and to what extent can we apprehend that? To what extent can we actually grasp that? And so I, I used in the introduction this sort of uh, analogy of those visual image um, illusion sort of you look at a picture and it looks like a duck and then if you stare at it long enough it kind of flips and the beak becomes ears and you realize oh it could be seen as a rabbit as well and so both of those are sort of different paradigms of looking at the same thing and and both of them have a certain truth depending on how you're interpreting the evidence so i, I sort mean, of I use that as mm. a way of trying to think about our models of god can be very different but maybe they're both reflecting a different way of seeing the same the same thing i suppose you know one thing that you could say about the book i mean maybe a, a, an accusation that could could be hurled against it is that you know oh well, this is just kind of postmodern you know typical avoiding the you know the hard answer you know all cats are gray in the dark sort of thing i mean how do you know because you like like the many modern novels there are there and and, and kind of um, dramas now even there are there are different endings that you can pick for yourself um, how do you respond to that yeah i think that i i probably have two responses one is that to say that although i've written all of these paths there is one that i like best <laughs> so okay. I'm not actually saying that I think that all of these are equally good. I, I definitely don't believe that. But I think that what I am saying is that all of these have been experiences people have had of God in the world that have been helpful. So when I first sort of discovered um, heartbreak in, in, in my undergrad, uh, what I found amazing was how different the sort of views people had on suffering. So one person would say, you know, you know, what helped me so much was just the idea that God wouldn't send me more than I could handle. And God has a plan. And although this is terrible now, God's going to get me through this and everything will be fine. And for them, that was just the most wonderful promise and, and thing that sustained them. And somebody else would come up and say, you know, I don't think God intended this at all. I think that this is not according to God's plan. Bad things happen, um, but God will be there with you for it and will, will redeem the circumstances through God's own creativity. Those are irreconcilable positions. And yet both these people were people who I respected, who I knew had gone through real suffering, and who had found Christ in both those theological options. And I, I didn't know what to do with that. <laughs> so what, it, what I tried to do in this is sort of represent that and say, 
represent that part of my experience that people with very different views have, have found Christ in the midst of suffering uh, through them. So would you say that, that it's more of a kind of pastoral sort of approach that you're taking rather than a kind of analytical, philosophical approach? I think it's a philosophical approach done with a pastoral aim. So one, so there's there's a wider discussion here. Sort of there's the people who do theodicy, this sort of branch of theology that deals with suffering and tries to justify God. That's mm -hmm. absolutely intellectual only. And they all those books start with don't ever give this to anyone who's suffering. This is the wrong book. And then you've got the anti-theodicists, and I'm thinking of people like uh, John Swinton up at Aberdeen, who says, you know what, that game that philosophers play is absolutely useless, we should chuck it out and get back to acts of hospitality, acts of lament, you know, practical activities that actually help those who suffer. Um, but in my research, I came across a bunch of really interesting psychological research, some done in just basic pain studies by people like Irene Tracy, some done in looking at how people respond and how their theology changes the way they experience natural disasters. So Jamie Aiton's work at Wheaton. And what they said was that the way you think about suffering changes how much you suffer. It changes your experience of suffering. So we've all probably experienced, um, well, we've all you know, had vaccination shots recently. So we've had needles. And for somebody like me who doesn't mind needles, that's a tiny little pinprick. It doesn't, doesn't phase me for a moment. But somebody who's afraid of needles, that little pinprick becomes a significant source of suffering despite it really not being physically very damaging. And so there are psychological ways to help them change the way they think so that that moment of, of harm becomes something in which they suffer a great deal less. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do is trying to say the way we think about life in the world changes how, how much we suffer. So actually John Swinton, well, we should lament and we should act hospitably, and we should, you know, do all these practical things. We shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater on what the intellectual side can bring to our experience of suffering. Yeah, I must say, I found your um, the the afterwards to your book where you kind of you know talk about the just the sort of rationale for why you're writing it uh, really fascinating, and those two case studies that you kind of bring up um, one about the, um, uh, the way that paintings can um, mm. uh, pe people uh, react differently to paintings um, uh, uh, in, in, in terms of their response to pain. Similarly, um, the Hurricane Katrina uh, example. Can you, can you talk a little bit further about those? Because they're really interesting and, and get at this, um, this argument that you're trying to make that the way we think really has a massive influence on the way we experience pain, really. Yeah, so Irene Tracy, uh, who, who works in the Nuffield uh, anesthetic department just up the hill here in Oxford, her, her work is just trying to figure out what kind of psychological approaches change our experience of pain. So what she did with the, with the paintings was she took a group of highly devout Roman Catholic Christian believers and a group of atheists as, as their control. And she had them look at two different paintings um, while she electrocuted them. <laughs> so we had, we, had a, we had a painful stimulus that could be controlled for how intense it was, right? Probably the, the, the easiest way to sort of inflict pain and, and have some sense of how much pain people are feeling. And had both groups look at the sort of Renaissance picture, woman with an ermine, just sort of a, a woman who, you know, is drawn in this, in this particular style. And everybody had relatively bad pain. Uh, and then she moved them over and had them look at the painting of, of Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus. And suddenly something happened 
where the, the religious people watching it reported lower experiences of pain. And it was something about how they were busy contemplating Mary's life of her walking through life, loving Jesus, and yet watching him die on the cross, and then his resurrection, something about framing their own experience within that narrative experience meant that although they were receiving a high amount of, of painful stimulus, a really painful experience, it didn't, it didn't hit them as suffering in quite the same way. Um, and, and so that, uh, that process of reappraisal, of rethinking about how you are situated in relation to suffering, just on, on the most basic reductive way shapes our experience of pain. Um, the second one with Jamie Aiton. Jamie is a, a wonderful, wonderful man. And, you know, I just remember sitting down with him and talking to him for hours over a lunch when I was over in Cambridge. And the, the, he, he has a most peculiar spiritual gift of always managing to move somewhere just before a natural disaster hits. So he had moved to Louisiana right before Katrina hit. He moved to New York right before Sandy hit. You know, he, he moved again. Um, and then, uh, and he's talked about this publicly about, about uh, getting cancer and then working through all these issues. So he had been studying for years people's, how people's religious frameworks carried them or didn't carry them through points of suffering. So what he found, particularly with Hurricane Katrina, was that people who thought the hurricane was divine judgment, that it was because God was judging their sin, uh, had a really hard time walking through that. that. That really sort of affected their ability to be resilient in suffering. Um, whereas people who encountered it and, and instead thought of God as a loving father figure who was with them in it and was supporting them and helping them love their neighbor in need and be loved by those who were around them had a much better time. And so in a sense, it's, it's a much more complex extension of this same phenomenon that Irene Tracy was, was studying. Uh, I mean, Regent has that wonderful reframe uh, set of videos, but that's that's really the key: is how are we reframing our experiences theologically, uh, and that and that seems to make a real difference. So it's it's I've talked about it as sort of cognitive behavioral therapy for the soul. It's it's like CBT. <laughs> so so how did those two two studies impact then your your approach to this book? Well, what one is that do based on them. Yeah, so, so one was to not abandon the intellectual endeavor, that theodicy, this branch of theology that deals with suffering, could be, could be therapeutically useful while staying theodicy. <laughs> it, I didn't have to abandon that sort of intellectual search for meaning in, in favor of caring for others or lamenting or those sorts of things that actually making meaning out of suffering intellectually is part of how we we do it. Um, I think the the thing with Jamie Aitens was that, again, he sort of points out that people had really different models that were that were beneficial to them. So it wasn't like there was one model that stood out as absolutely the best. Um, you know that we could say everybody should view it this way. Instead, he was he was finding that um, the way that people's lives were shaped, their experience, their community, all helped shape which model they found the most useful. And so, I wanted to honor that uh, by providing a variety of models. So, I mean, with these different pathways, um, you make it clear that. They're really connected with very different conceptions of God, actually, different understandings of, of, of God. So the, um, the, the, the question of, of why am I suffering, what, what is suffering, um, is, is, is connected to 
this bigger sense of of who God is, if if indeed if there's a God at all, um, and some of the, uh, the 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 options that you lay out for Christians, particularly because they're not, they're not all, all of the options are not for Christians, are they? No, you've got, they're not. You've got an option for non for non Christians to kind of um, take a you know maybe a, a more spiritual, vaguer, um, or perhaps a, even a different re religious. Uh, line altogether, um, and even and also for for atheists. We'll, so we'll come back to that. But the the options that you lay for Christians, you've got some very classical options that have been around for hundreds of years, haven't they? You know uh, about notions about the sovereignty of God and 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 you know the kind of freedom of the human being, the, so on. But um, you've also got some perhaps more modern. Um, con and quite controversial understandings of God. You know, God doesn't. Uh, you know, God isn't all powerful. For example, or God. God doesn't know the future. So, and yet, you through each one of these, you just map out the options here. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think I think I've seen enough to say that you know, options have changed over the centuries. So yeah, some have been there sort of all the way along and some certainly reflect this sort of theological transition that came out of two world wars. I mean, I think that that had a profound psychological effect on 20th century thought and that is reflected in people like Jürgen Moltmann um, or uh, W. H. Van Stone and and others who are who are trying to piece theology back together after the tremendous suffering that you see in in World War II, where some of those classical views um, just didn't seem to 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 answer anymore. And uh, you know, and and in that you have the the engagement of process philosophy, which is you know, developed by Alfred North Whitehead uh, in the early part of the 20th century. So I think, I think that I do try and reflect those. I don't reflect them chronologically. So reading through, you'd have no sense that this is a newer view or that's an older view apart from, you know, having wider knowledge or, or really yeah, working wonder, your way I wonder, into bibliography. I, I wonder if that isn't a problem because, um, you know, you clearly want to speak to a wide audience and yet I wonder how many of the pastors of these folk, for example, um, would respond well to them um, coming up with, with you know, a, a, a kind of suggestion, well, uh, God doesn't know the future. God, you know, God's power is limited or God, you know, um, th these would, because they, precisely because they do clash with standard um, historic approaches to these issues it, it, it yeah. does raise sort of issues at a, at a church level even doesn't it well I mean it it could and yet people like Tom Ward who's probably the foremost voice of of sort of that God is not powerful enough um or at least that's not the right kind of power to ascribe to God uh you know has has found a huge set of people who have written to him saying I'd never heard anything like this in my church. And yet that's exactly what I needed to hear right now so that I didn't abandon Christianity altogether. Mm -hmm. So I think um, one, of the, one of the sort of analogies I've been playing with is the idea that sometimes our experiences might give us something that's akin to a theological allergy to a particular model. So it's, 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 it's nothing against wheat or gluten and its nutritious value to humanity if I have celiac and eating it will actually damage me. So, you know, it's not just that I can't process it, it will actually begin to damage the stomach lining if, if I had celiac and I'm eating wheat. That's no, that's no point of offense to wheat. <laughs> so I think that there are certain models of God that may be absolutely good, wonderful, you know, sustaining uh, discipleship over the centuries and are good. Um, and yet somebody's experience may just make that an impossible one for them to stomach. Uh, and it's not saying anything about 
the the truth value or or the usefulness of that in the church it's just saying they've gotten into a place where that is no longer a helpful a helpful paradigm for them and they need something else to still hold on to christ and and so it's precisely because i think some of these other options that i've presented wouldn't normally be in a local church setting that's why i included them you know mm. and i i even included atheism partially because i just know so many people who moved away from christianity through atheism before coming back it's like it's like atheism was almost a palate cleanser um that allowed them to move away from particularly damaging models of god uh to rediscover the grace and love of of christ mm. Mm. Um, so, you know, I do think atheism is closer to the truth than some <laughs> models of God that are sometimes purported in church, right? Interesting, yeah. Uh, um, I mean, yeah, well, that's, um, that's a, you know, that is a very, very interesting question. And we, <laughs> that could, we could, we could probably <laughs> spend the rest of the time talking about that. But, um, I mean, you, you don't give away, really. You said earlier that you um you know there's one pathway that you you kind of prefer but you don't really give that away which is the are you going to tell us or are you going to you know you're, you're gonna <laughs> oh i don't people? know i don't know um yeah. i i i don't i don't want to tip the reader into thinking that this is the you know really the best way or that i was secretly arguing for that so i mean yeah. if, if people are interested it wouldn't take too much searching on the internet to find out what i do think um that that is well, that is yeah, public knowledge and i mean here you are you know here you are um a researcher in the whole thinking about god and evolution um mm -hmm. that must have shaped your i mean you, you you talked about the way the 20th century has kind of challenged um, classical understandings of, of of God and suffering and evil in the world, um, but so has you know so has the rise of, of modern science in some ways, isn't it? In many in many ways, and particularly um, the theory of evolution. Um, and I, I wonder, I mean, you've you've got a section towards the end of the book on on animal suffering, particularly, which is obviously you know very close to your to your heart maybe where did did, did your whole journey about this begin with with the question of, of animal suffering before it came to human suffering in some ways no actually so i started with wondering about human suffering when i was in bible college and sort of encountered this heartbreak um yeah. and doing animal suffering was the only way i could think of to make it academically unique <laughs> enough to do a phd in the area of suffering because of course theodicy is one of the most burnt over areas so i thought well i'll do evolution and suffering and at the yeah. time i made that decision which was right before i came to regent uh there there were no books published in this and then sort of the next year i think three books were published on animal suffering and evolution and i thought oh no so i took the best one and went to study under him for my phd um because i mean in some ways the the whole theory of evolution rules out some of the classical understandings of of this doesn't it i mean it, it in terms of for example the place of the fall in in mm. evil and suffering yeah. um and you know the and, and certainly the advent of death into the world um i mean if you take seriously the the, the theory of evolution that's got to challenge your understanding of the place of death big time hasn't it well there are i i think so so on that i'm willing to put my you know and 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 place my cards on the table and say yeah i think i think if you say evolution is the way god created then it means that god used death and suffering and so these aren't alien intrusions upon the world they're somehow part of god's big story uh having said that i will say that there are plenty of very intelligent Christians who would disagree with me. So my colleague, Michael Lloyd, would say, no, 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 where we see death and suffering, even in the evolutionary scheme, that that is because of the satanic fall. That's because Satan sort of messed with evolution long before humans were around, which actually is, is what C.S. Lewis said 
uh, as well. So there are people who accept evolution, but would still tell a story that would say that suffering and, and evil are um, not what God intended. I, I don't think those hold up. Uh, I don't think they hold up scripturally where God keeps saying the world as we see it is very good, including death. Um, but <laughs> you know we can we can have that debate another time. So I, I do I do include views like that. Um, and Gregory Boyd, who again would similarly say, you know, evolution happened, but but death still wasn't God's idea uh, in in the options. You're um, uh, you, you obviously include this this pathway for atheists as you, as you've mentioned, and um, I just wonder why is I've often wondered this actually, why is suffering and evil at all a problem for atheists? I think it's a, I think it's a different kind of problem. So I, I, I don't think that they think, I mean, for one, for one point, they would say it's, it's not a problem, it's the solution in the sense of it, it demonstrates that we're in a world where there is no God. Um, but I think that it becomes a problem when they think, why me? So if, if all my meaning is self-made and I am the master of my own destiny and I've done all the things right, I haven't smoked and I've done lots of cardio and all of this, what happens when you get cancer in your 30s? So I think, I think that you know, there's an existential human question of pain is painful, suffering is unpleasant. Um, and, and why should it have to hurt as bad as it does? So I think, I think that those are, are questions that are linked to our common humanity long before they get involved in religious questions. Yeah, I noticed that in the acknowledgements that you, um, you um, thank Richard Dawkins, and I wonder if you, uh, did you send any of this to him? Did you discuss any of this I with did. him? Yeah, yeah, we had lunch together. And he was kind enough to sort of look over the path and read over the atheist pathway. And I said, you know, have I represented you well? Do you feel like I'm putting any sort of straw man here? And he just said, no, I think, I think that there's more that could be said, which is fair, uh, but that what you represented is more or less what, what I would say, or, you know, is, is representative. So again, I, I sort of tried to find my harshest critic uh, and, and see if, um, if they could recognize their own position. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating with, with Dawkins, uh, certainly with plenty of other atheists, you get um, clearly uh, there's a critique of religion, um, but also I would say an anger at the very idea of God, even an, an anger at God. Um, that, you know, you think of people like Stephen Fry, the British actor, is kind of very prominent um, in these debates in the UK, certainly. And there's this um, there's this anger ab about the the presence of diseases that affect children, for example, in the world. You know, worms that kind of eat into the eye and 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 this sort of thing. You know, mm -hmm. wouldn't it have been possible if you believe in God? Surely you can imagine a world that didn't, you know, that didn't um, have such a thing present. You know, if, if God had, had made it or had anything to do with it at all, sure that surely that would be a, a thing. And then you know, Nietzsche had a joke, didn't he? Um, that uh, you know, God's God's only excuse is that he doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, um, but uh, you know, the 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 whole idea of evil and suffering being a problem why i mean it maybe strikes at our humanity but isn't that some sort of irrationality i mean if if it is just a case that you know the universe is this um this thing that just happens every now and again as uh, one of the, your quotes says um surely that's not an issue at all is it well I, 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 you know, want to be careful that I'm not speaking for atheists in, in, in that. Um, mm. But I think, I think that where, where the anger is often directed is at, is at Christians who then refuse sort of the benefits of science, for example. 
Mm. So we're, we're just going to refuse to get vaccinated or we're going to refuse to, um, you know, offer life-saving surgery to a child. Um, and, and so they're saying, you know, it, it doesn't need to be as painful as, as it is. Uh, and and you're you're refusing this, and I think there is some truth to that claim. So one of the one of the pathways that I include is the path of of sort of mystery that we simply can't understand suffering, and it's always going to be beyond the, us to to figure it out. And I think at some level that is always going to be the final place of any honest theist. <laughs> at some point, we're going to say. My answers are never good enough. I don't know what God is doing with this. And I have to just say, I'm, I, I, I wait for your kingdom, your will be done. And I, I, can't, I can't make sense of this. But I think there is a critique of saying, sometimes we do that too soon. You know, if, if somebody has diabetes and all the doctors had just said, well, this is a mystery and we can't possibly do anything about it, there would be thousands and millions of lives that were much shorter and much poorer than they are today because people refuse to take mystery as an answer. So I think we're always we're always sitting on this sort of tightrope of options between saying we can't figure it out all out, we can't control it all. Sometimes we have more control than than is good for us. So you could look at the attempt to solve pain with opioids as a good example of how our attempt to get rid of all pain actually itself became detrimental. Um, that somehow, somewhere we need suffering and pain and, and trying to work out those options, uh, both theologically, philosophically, and practically are, are really, really tough. They take a lot of reflection and they're not easy. Mm. You, you've obviously tried very hard to be fair in this book to the, the various um, op options on offer. Why isn't despair one of your options? Because it, well, it has been an yeah. option for a lot of people through time, isn't it? Yeah, I think the closest one I have to that is the protest, um, which, is, which is the idea that even if God is real, even if the heavenly glories are all going to be everything they're cracked up to be, where everything will be reconciled, it's not worth the cost of the suffering we see on earth. So, I mean, Dostoevsky articulates this, um, Ursula Le Guin and her, the ones who walked away from Omalas. And I mean, that chapter is the one that has real suffering in it. And, you know, and I do sort of base it on, on her story. Um, and I, 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 you know, and so, and so in my depiction of it, I have the person sort of sitting in a cave <laughs> on the edge of the map just sitting down and protesting. And I think, I think that that's maybe a more, a more active form of despair rather than just somebody laying down on the path and, and refusing to move anymore. Um, well, I mean, you know, some people have, have literally taken the, the route of suicide, haven't they? For example, you know, yeah. intellectually. It, yeah, I mean, pe pe you know, obviously that is a, um, a sensitive subject because it, it's, it's about one's, one's, one's um, uh, kind of, mental I, state and you know for yeah. all sorts of reasons but it, it can be simply a question of despair yeah well i guess because this is a book that's meant to help people reframe in more positive ways yeah. <laughs> then that 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 that's not one of the more positive reframing i don't think that that would help anybody to just land them in a pit and in a similar way i didn't include the idea that suffering happens because god is judging you or punishing you uh, yeah. because all the psychological literature says that is one of the most damaging uh positions people can hold so for the most part i tried to represent everything fairly whether or not i thought it was helpful mm -hmm. but those are two examples of things i excluded um because i thought we don't you know, I don't think anybody will benefit from that. So I, I mean, I, I, I think the, um, the, the way that you've done this is, is incredibly creative and very, um, very interesting too. Um, I, I wonder if you've, if you've done any tests with people, just given them the book and see, you know, how they've actually used it. I mean, have they done what you suggest or do they like me 
you know, kind of, I'm, I have to go from page to page, otherwise I don't know what I'm doing. But that's very old fashioned, isn't it, and linear. But um, what's what's the kind of the test case here? Yeah, so it's only come out um, a, a couple of weeks ago, really. And so oh. I don't know on a wider scale for test audiences, um, the people who tried to read it cover to cover, despite all the warnings at the beginning, found it just really distressing. You know, they're like, I just can't read this sort of stop start way. So I just read it straight through. And then I found myself really disoriented. <laughs> I was going, well, yeah, <laughs> nothing's going to connect if you do it that way. So, um, so, uh, and, and it tended to be academics. It tended to be the people who were, who were <laughs> sure that they'd be smart enough to just be able to read it through and hold it all together that, that ended up it, it being a total failure for. Um, whereas I've had other people who have said, oh my goodness, finally a book I can give to you know, my, my husband who, or my uh, girlfriend or, you know, somebody who uh, has always wondered why I'm so into theology and has, has looked at it that way. In terms of people who are actually suffering, uh, I've had one or two responses from people who've been in a situation who said this has been helpful. Um, and I don't know if there are other people who have also been in situations of suffering and found it not helpful and therefore not decided to write. So the, the problem with something like that is that in order to have a good control group, you need to be able to predict the suffering that's happening and uh, that would be unethical to do. So uh, I, will, I will wait and I, I will hope that people will write me and just let me know um, both, and this is to, to the people who are listening, uh, if it's helpful, if it's not helpful, or if you think it could be changed to be more helpful, do write me. I'd love to hear from you, and I'd, I'd love to know how to improve this, because this really is sort of a wild experiment into the unknown, and I don't know, I don't know how it will work. Yeah, I mean, I, as I say, I, I, I think... I. I can see it's 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 creative and an and interesting way of doing it. And you you obviously you not only want to be fair, but you want to be gentle in your approach to this. But doesn't these don't these questions precisely come out of the brutal experiences of life? Um, the hard, um, you know, personal things that we we, we experience. Um, and bitter experiences that we have. And then the stuff we see on television, because nothing's closed off even for children now, is it? You know, that we, we witness these, these kind of atrocities and awful things that happen on a, on a daily basis. Um, I wonder if it's really possible to be as gentle and as kind of, you know, um, coaxing as you are in, in this book, because... I mean, in some ways, what you could say then is what it avoid, what it helps the reader to avoid is the hard questions, the tough problems with their own position. If they're able to plot their, their route through this, are they ever really challenged with somebody else's point of view who might be utterly critical of what you're saying, what, what, what's being argued at that point? Yeah, so... One, I, I assume that anybody who, who picks up a book called Why Is There Suffering will have their own experience of suffering or their own case studies in mind. So I, I don't think that I actually need to fill those for people. Um, either they'll read through and they'll find it helpful to their situation or they won't and they'll get rid of the book. But I didn't, I didn't feel it was right for me to use other people's stories of suffering as sort of case studies that just seemed pretty horrible to me let let people who've experienced severe horrors um find their own meaning without me objectifying them that way so i, I partly just didn't want to to use people in the way that theodicists often do um, but i also sort of think if if my job is to help a person make meaning of their own experience and because we're only connected by a book, there's no way I can know their own experience. Then 
the only way to ground it in, in their own personal experience is for me to not give examples <laughs> in a way. So I'm actually trying to ground it more deeply by being a little bit more abstract because, you know, I'm, I'm saying, I don't know what your experience is, but you do. And you can decide whether a path resonates. As to critiquing people, I mean, my hope is that people won't just read one path. I expect most people will read one path that, that most fits what they already believe first. And then I'm hoping that they'll go back and, and reread another path. That something will be interesting or they'll think, well, I think both of those are true. Okay, so I'll read this path and then I'll come back and read that other path. And so it's, it's a way of drawing them in to, to reading the critique without being harsh. I mean, nobody would think if you go into a counselor, the best counselor is the one who sort of slaps you across the face and says, you know, toughen up. And I think that that's what a lot of the theodicy literature basically does. Like, here's the, here's the truth. Just deal with it. Suck it up, you know. And, and so I'm like... But that's, I mean, you know, on the other hand, you know, what one could say isn't, you know, the... I mean, I'm, I'm thinking the Daily Mail now in the UK. This is the snowflake generation, you know, um, tough, tough enough. Precisely, that's the, the, the kind of, you want to avoid the thing that is going to actually rock your understanding and rock your position. So you've got to have trigger warnings and all this kind of stuff in, in, in class. Well, that might be okay on some issues, but here, if you're really struggling to understand what's going on in the world, um, to be to be allowed to to think about well maybe God is coaxing creation wooing creation you know God's kind of weaving a pattern making a tune like a jazz player out of history um, and then you come across the Dostoevsky story which you 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 do tell um, which is a shocking story and a brilliant story in many ways isn't it and you're thinking God must be a monster therefore. If that's, you know, making a tune out of these things, that seems to be utterly, utterly barbaric and, um, well, yeah, I mean, scandalous, I would say. Maybe maybe even something that that is a blasphemy against life itself. Um, so, you know, by, by choosing your own route here, are you actually doing people a favour? I don't know. <laughs> so I don't, I, I genuinely don't know. Um, and we'll see. But I was just trying to do something different from what's out there because I found that literature violent and traumatizing and terrible um, and, and not helpful. And um, so I, I had a really tough time in my PhD because working mm -hmm. through the literature that was existent was just so traumatic. You know, um, where I had uh, serious issues coming coming through that. So I'm just trying something different, and mm. it may not be the right approach for everybody. And if it's not, then they should put it down and and find something else. I mean, if they want that sort of slap in the face literature, there's lots of it out there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so they're they're very welcome to go. You know, grab your Richard Swinburne and uh, have at it. But I I I. I, I hope, I think, I guess that there are other people like me out there for whom a gentler approach. And I think Eleanor Stump and her book, Wandering in Darkness, really sort of helped me to see that that gentler approach actually can be really useful because her book is like that. It it only uses, you know, the suffering that that she does use case studies, but they're case studies like uh, a brother who's a musician can't share his beloved music with a tone deaf sister, you know, so, so, but it being so gentle meant that I wasn't emotionally traumatized on every page, which actually, as I, as I began to read more sort of trauma studies and that kind of thing, what they're saying is that if you're emotionally straining the front part of your brain, the brain that pro processes things analytically actually gets impaired it sort of shuts down and so you can't actually do that higher level thinking if you're being emotionally under a lot of stress so i think that these authors in 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 trying to show that um that they're facing real suffering are actually disadvantaging 
their readers because they're ma they're making the conditions impossible for people to do that sort of analytical thinking that they're asking people to do. So um, I I don't know ultimately if this will work. I, I assume that it won't work for everybody. And you know, like I said, I've had a few readers have already said, you know, I the, the, it's a nice idea, but it's not for me. Um, mm. And I've had a few readers who've said this is wonderful and this is just what I've been looking for. So, you know, I, it's not a book for everybody and it's certainly not the panacea and it's certainly not the final word in how all theodicy should be done. Um, it's just an exploration of a new way. It certainly is. And it's, 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 it's kind of really, really, really interesting way as well. You, um, yeah, I mean, do you, do you feel that when you were doing this academic study, particularly that you were coming out, you know, up against people who not only shove stuff in your face, as it were, um, brutally and probably maybe inappropriately. I mean, you talk about weeping while you were reading a lot of this stuff, mm -hmm. doing your research. Um, but do you feel like the the whole attempt to come up with one answer, one solution, as a theological and philosophical solution to these, is is doomed from the start? I, I do, um, partially just because I know that there are different types of suffering. So if I stub my toe really bad, that, that causes a lot of suffering. But there are really good reasons why it's better for me to feel pain when I stub my toe than if I didn't. <laughs> you know. So if I had a congenital insensitivity to pain, I couldn't feel pain, I would slowly destroy my own body just by not feeling pain. So that actually is really necessary to a good life on earth. Um, that's a very different kind of suffering than if you're in an abusive relationship of some sort where that there's no necessity to that kind of suffering. And I think it, it needs a different explanation. So, you know, from, from stubbing a toe, which is the sort of easiest salute, you know, kind of suffering to give a good answer for, to the really complex sort of um, situations of, of interrelationship or war or you know those kind of things that, that need a much more complex uh, answer. So I, I yeah, so I think anything that says, well, it all comes down to free will is is just wrong because you're not taking the sciences seriously enough. You know, but anybody who says, you know, it just comes down to pain as a survival mechanism. Uh, is is not seeing the full picture either. And then, of course, I think that there's that whole mystery of Christ's passion and resurrection that just gets mixed up with everything um, in ways that that nothing is left untouched by by that Christian story. Um, so yeah, I would I would and and in my own sort of the, that first book, God, Evolution, and Animal Suffering, I definitely say we need, you know, several different strands of explanation depending on what kind. So even even before I was I was being quite as radical here, I was saying I think that the best explanation is always going to be multiple and perspectival. Mm. Yeah, and uh, it, I mean it does seem that this is such a problem, especially for Christians, precisely because of our uh, our faith in a God of love. Um, you know, it's absolutely at this, the heart of, of creation, the heart of, uh, of existence. And so it becomes more of a problem, perhaps, than for, for people who take a, um, a different perspective on God or a different uh, um, path of belief entirely. But um, on the other hand, it does seem that we have resources uh, because of the 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 the, um, the story of Christ because of the incarnation and the the cross and the, the resurrection it does seem that there is something at the heart of our faith that also provides um an answer that virtually nothing else can give yeah yeah both I mean the idea that God suffers with us that God hasn't volunteered us for sort of a lab rat experiment for God's own purposes but comes and lives with us and and experiences both the pleasure and the pain you know the joy of relationship and the bitterness of betrayal um and and particularly suffering absolutely innocently 
you know, there is embodied in that, not, not an answer, but a, a sense of fellowship <laughs> in the worst kinds of suffering that, that we can experience. And I think that some of the best, some of the best approaches to suffering aren't technically answers. <laughs> so, so, you know, the most comforting thing may not be, oh, well, here are the six reasons I can break down for you. But to say, look at Jesus, look at the cross, look at his death, but also remember his resurrection. Also remember that this is not the end of the story. There is a, there is a whole story to unfold. And it may be that meaning is only made properly then. So we can search as much as we want for meaning now, but, but that meaning hasn't actually been created yet. Um, well, we've been talking about Bethany's book, Bethany Solareda. Uh, here we are. Why is there suffering? Pick your own theological expedition. And uh, it's published by Zondervan. Thanks so much for joining us, uh, uh, Bethany. Uh, best wishes. Thanks to our viewers and uh, all the best. See you again soon. Thank you.